Hello, everybody. So welcome to the second annual Felicia A. Fulton Lecture. I'm Laura Rich and the Vice President of Outreach and Education for the Archaeological Institute of America. We are so in delighted to continue this new idea of having our Holton winners, which are the, the best book for the lay audience, uh, according to AIA each year. And this is our second foray into having our authors share some thoughts with us. So let me introduce that Sarah Partek is an archeologist and Egyptologist and has worked on excavations in 14 countries across the globe since 1999. Sarah attended Yale for, the B, for her BA and received her uh, master's and PhD degrees from Cambridge University in the UK in 2005. She lectured at the University of Wales Swansea before starting work in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in 2006, where she is now a full professor. Sarah is the author of Satellite Remote Sensing for Archaeology and Archaeology from Space on How the Sh Future Shapes Our Past, which was the Holton winner. Uh, it also won the Phi Beta Kappa 2020 Book Award for Science, as well as many peer-reviewed academic papers. She is a National Geographic Society Explorer, a young global leader, a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, a TED Senior Fellow, and winner of the 2016 TED Prize, the 2016 recipient of the Smithsonian Institute American Ingenuity Award, a 2018 recipient of the Explorers Club Lowell Thomas Award, and a 2020 recipient of the Roy Chapman Andrews Society Distinguished Explorers Award. Sarah serves as the founder and president of Global Explorer, a nonprofit dedicated to using cutting edge technologies to protect and preserve cultural heritage. She co-directs the joint list mission with Egypt's Ministry of Antiquities, which focuses on the excavation and survey of Egypt's Middle Kingdom capital. Her research has been featured in multiple BBC Discovery Channel and PBS Nova documentaries. Sarah collaborates with her husband, Dr. Greg Mumford, on multiple archaeological projects when they are not busy chasing after their nine-year-old son, Gabriel, who already knows more about ancient Egypt than they do. I totally believe that, having had a nine-year-old once. Her hobbies include bird watching, golf, and baking, and now we get to enjoy some time with Sarah. Great, thank you so much. Um, it's a real honor to be here today to be speaking with you. Um, I first wanna start by um, thanking the Archaeological Institute of America. I've been a member forever. Uh, it's an extraordinary organization that does incredible work um, advocating for archeology, span archeology span education and outreach in the US and around the world. Um, I get to, I've gotten to meet so many new friends um, and, and a conference is wonderful. If you haven't ever been, I highly recommend going. Um, but, but really I want to thank them for considering archeology span um, from space for this honor and deciding to, um, to award the Felicia Holton award to it. Um, uh, I was absolutely not expecting this, this extraordinary honor. And I fully admit when I got the email from them, I, I cried. It was so incredibly meaningful to me. Um, you know, I, I was lucky to serve as an academic trustee for years um, at, at the AIA. I still support it, um, still will, will be going to the conferences for the rest of my career. So um, I really just want to thank the AIA, the members of the AIA book committee, the general trustees and other trustees uh, for deciding it, um, to, to award this, the, the, the Holton Award to, to this book. I also would like to um, thank uh, Henry Holt uh, at, at, and the wonderful team at Macmillan for deciding to publish Archaeology from Space. They were its champions from my first meeting uh, with them. I also want to thank my wonderful book editor, Steve Ross, who um, also has just been a tireless champion for, um, for allowing me to write. So what I wanna do in my lecture today is a little bit of a departure from um, lectures I've given before. I didn't want to talk as much about my work 
um, I wanted to share with all of you how to write a popular book or rather a popular archaeology book. Now, clearly I'm just one person. Um, there are a lot of other wonderful people who uh, have written and are continuing to write great archaeology books, uh, but I wanted to talk you through the process of how I learned to write, um, who gets to write, uh, why we need more popular archaeology books, uh, why we need stories about the past, and what I hope to do, um, what I hope happens after this lecture today, is that some of you are inspired to begin to go on this journey. Um, you know, the, the, the number one rule for being a writer is putting your rear end in a seat and writing. Um, there's no secret sauce for writing. That is it right there. And you write and you write and you write and you keep rewriting. So, you know, that's, that's it. But I want to talk to you about kind of tools, tips, hints, uh, because of course you have the most extraordinary tableau imaginable, that of past. Um, and how do you, what mediums do you use to share these stories? How do you tell the story of yourself? How do you connect to readers? How do you write a book people are actually going to read? Um, and these are things, by the way, that I'm still figuring out. You're never done learning how to write. It is a lifelong process. So um, writing about the past, how to find your voice and become a better storyteller. So I want to talk to you about why we need popular archaeology stories, or why I think we need popular archaeology stories. Um, and I don't have long, I only you know, have 40, 45 minutes to share everything with you, so at times I may speed up, at times I may slow down. Uh, obviously feel free to ask any questions at the end of this lecture. Um, the world is kind of a mess right now. Um, we have reports of out-of-control wildfires uh, in the West, in Canada, um, we saw archaeological sites threatened in Greece. Um, some of you may have seen, maybe it was two months ago, um, there were pretty major fires uh, that got close to Machu Picchu. Um, they may have destroyed some archaeology, archaeological sites, we're not sure, um, but certainly the site was threatened. Uh, we are seeing major droughts all over the world. Uh, if on the other hand, after droughts or periods of, of no, no rain, we're seeing periods of intense rainfall that are impacting communities that are far, far inland, St. Louis, Dallas, all over the world. Massive rainfall that happens virtually overnight and there's flooding. Um, there are super storms on the way. Of course, we've been contending with COVID for the last two and a half years. This pandemic is not over. Um, now monkeypox and now polio has come back again. Um, it's a mess right now, and not just with climate change, of course, but the incredible tensions around the world, um, around politics and the rise of authoritarianism, uh, the war in Ukraine. I could go on and on, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but there's a lot going on in the world. Um, and what I think archaeology does is it helps us to kind of take a breath, and understand and reframe and provide more context to what's happening in the world as a whole. Because while things are happening faster and at larger scales and are impacting more people, these are all things that have impacted humanity for thousands and thousands of years. Um, to me, I think the most impactful work that my colleagues in archeology span did and people who write about archeology, span um, they wrote about past pandemics. They wrote about issues that people were dealing with in Greece and Egypt and elsewhere. And it's the same stories that we heard and can hear today. Stories about climate change and resilience um, are so important because I think right now around the world, we are suffering from hopelessness, right? Because if you have no hope, then that's it. What's the point? People, a lot of people I know are sort of walking through the motions right now, just getting through a day. A lot of people have given up. And what archeology span does, what our stories about humanity and how culture has evolved does, I think for us, is it makes us understand we're, we're part of this long um, story and, and things don't just end, things evolve. How do they evolve? For whom do they evolve? Who's impacted the most? Um, I'll talk a little bit today about collapse because I don't like the term collapse. Collapse for whom? Is it the 1%? What happens to everybody else when systems fail? So what archaeology does is it helps us to appreciate um, that, that there's hope, 
then and a lot of good can come out of disaster. You know, look at all the new conversations we're having now around race and gender um, and and equality that I don't think we were having as as much of even four or five years ago. The other thing that I want to talk a little bit about, um, we're seeing with the sort of rise of, of fascism, people have co-opted archaeological symbols and concepts and ideas. Um, this lovely gentleman who I think is now in a new house and has a lot of new friends and a new job. Um, but, but, but the idea that, that fascist co-op symbols of uh, around Vikings, indigenous symbolism, um, I, ideas and concepts from classics. Uh, and we as a field as a whole need to do a better job of communicating what these symbols actually meant. Um, you know, I think what we certainly um, can appreciate is because with, with the rise of technology, you, know, you may ask yourself, what's the point? No one's gonna read my book if I write it. Words last, stories last. Um, you know, with, with the pandemic, you know, books, books are flying off the shelves. People want to read books because stories matter. Stories have always mattered. Um, and, and, you know, for, I, I always like to tell this story. You know, whenever we watch sci-fi movies, um, I love Rogue One. The, the most extraordinary thing that came out of that movie wasn't that it was this space opera in a world, you know, galaxy far, far away on uh, a time long ago. Um, it, it was that that the jump drive from one spaceship would fit into another spaceship and then fit into a droid. Like, well, how's that jump drive working? Um, so, <laughs> so to me, it's, it's these great stories about technology, about what lasts. Um, and, you know, I have to imagine that we're telling the same stories that we told around campfires, tens of thousands years ago, I don't think the stories have changed that much. Tales of bravery and love, loss, survival, creativity, trickery. Um, you know, those storytellers had shadows in the night sky. Uh, and we all know the magic of the tales we hear around the campfire. Um, so finding that magic, finding what pulls people in and holds them uh, and, and captivates them in Sort of pushes yourself, pushes you into yourself and then out of yourself. You know, that's, that's the key. That's the magic of storytelling. And that's a gift that you can give people when you learn how to tell stories. So for me, that's the power. That's the necessity of writing popular archaeology books and telling these stories. And you'll hear me say again and again throughout my lecture today, I want more people telling stories because, you know, think, think of, think of, how you got to be where you are. Think about, um, think about all the extraordinary things you've seen as you've traveled around the world and as you've excavated. The other thing I think that the books allow us to do, popular books, um, there's so much complexity in the world and things are not necessarily black and white often. There's this big gray area and how do we detangle complexity? How do we make people understand that it's not just one or the other, that there are so many varying ways that we can appreciate a story or how a story might be told. Um, and that's what archeology span does to me. You know, certainly when I teach my classes, that's what I try to tell my students that we, we, we wanna see the answer and it's often ambiguous and it makes us uncomfortable um, and that's okay. You know, archeology span can help, help us to sit better with discomfort um, and really think through all the different ways we can look at issues and hopefully emerge with a better understanding of them. So the, the next thing I want to talk about is who gets to write stories for the general public? Who has gotten to write stories for the general public? And how is that changing and the extent to which it needs to continue to change? Um, you know, I, I think of all of these amazing authors who have written books that many, many of you may have read them for your classes. I think of, of uh, Ken Fetter and, and Eric Klein and Jody Magnus and, and so many other people whose writings have inspired me. Um, and we have a new generation of writers. Um, these are just a few examples of some of the great books that have come out in the last few years. Uh, Jennifer Ruff, 
uh, Dr. Jennifer F. just wrote Origin, A Genetic History of the Americas, and this made the New York Times a seller list. A wonderful, wonderful book, highly recommended. Um, and I was so proud of her. I was so proud um, that, that, you know, an archaeologist was in the New York Times bestseller list to know it wasn't a, a book about pseudo-archaeology. It was a, a, a really amazing contribution and summary um, of, of the genetic history of, of the Americas. Um, really wonderful books have been written for um, younger people and indigenous people's history of the United States for young people by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, adapted by um, Jean Mendoza and Debbie Reese. Again, you know, you don't you don't necessarily have to write popular books for adults. You write them for young adults. You can write them for kids. Um, all those things are are equally necessary. Um, and an incredible book. I highly recommend it. And the Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere by Dr. Paula Steves. Um, who's a professor in Canada. And Dr. Steves in her book takes um, indigenous perspectives and ideas and um, concepts and interweaves um, uh, new archeological discoveries uh, and shows how a lot of these new discoveries are validating long held indigenous views and beliefs. Um, so I, I, I recommend this for anyone teaching classes or anyone interested in learning more about the peopling of, of North America. And then finally, of course, um, the great book, um, Kindred, um, came out, I believe, two years ago or three years ago, just a, 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 a genre-defining book about um, Neanderthals. Uh, and uh, again, very much recommended, made all sorts of bestseller lists in, in England. And it's interesting because all these books have been written by women. Um, so I get, like I said, there, there's a lot more space in the tent for diverse ideas and diverse perspectives and we need more voices. It's essential um, that we have more diversity in, um, in, in what we read because of course we're inspiring students and they need to see that they too someday can write books like this. So you have to think when you're beginning to write a book because I think a lot of people go into book writing um, with visions, you know, potentially New York Times bestselling book. I'm going to sell tens of thousands of copies. I'm going to uh, I'm going to make a lot of money. Um, you know, I'm I'm going to get all this stuff. Don't think like that when you're writing a book. You're writing a book to write the book. Um, someone gave advice when I started writing archaeology from space because I'll, and I'll talk to you about my writing process. I was completely overwhelmed. The enormity of what I had set out to do didn't sink in until I started writing it. And then I thought, oh dear, I am in over my head. Um, so I think what I, what I encourage all of you to do, if you're thinking about writing a book, um, define what success means to you before the book is published. And think about realistic expectations because Hardly any books make the New York Times bestseller list. It is, it is sort of a game. It depends on how much publicity you get. It depends on um, what news outlets review it. And even extraordinary books that um, are incredibly well-written and uh, just fantastic books. They're, they don't necessarily all make bestseller lists, um, but they have major impact for other reasons. So think about who will read your book years from now. Think about um, the students that will read your book and may decide to change their careers because of it. The best part for me about writing archaeology from space, I mean, awards are lovely and wonderful, um, it, but to me, the most meaningful things that have happened, I've gotten, I don't know how many emails, I, I can't remember, but I've gotten at least a half dozen emails from people, mostly in the US, a couple people in Europe, that read archaeology from space and said it inspired them to go back to school and retake archaeology classes or take or, or go back and get the master's degree um, that that they always wanted to. They said the book, they said the book it felt like an invitation, that they were welcome in archaeology in a way that they'd never felt welcome before. And you know, those five or six people, I don't know if they actually went into those programs, a couple of them did. Who knows what impact they'll have on the fields, who else they'll inspire. Um, I've gotten some wonderful letters and notes from students in middle school and high school and college students. So again, think about 
what is going to mean the most to you. Um, because ultimately you, you want what you share with the world to inspire them. You want to make your field better. You want to share the excitement about what you're doing, but also to bring more people in. Um, you know, also people think being the author of a best-selling book changes everything. It changes everything and nothing. Um, Archaeology from Space did not make the New York Times bestseller list, by the way, it didn't. Um, they expect their lives to be different. And it's one more thing. I'll keep emphasizing this. A book is one more thing. You are an author, which is wonderful, um, but it doesn't define who you are and it shouldn't define who you are. Your passions, your, your ideals, your values, those should define who you are, um, not something you've, you've done. And if you keep that in perspective, then you, you know, you'll, you'll be a successful author. And what do I mean by that? It means you're gonna keep writing. And you'll hear me say that again and again throughout my lecture today. You get to keep writing, you get to do more. Um, you know, do, do it as well. For me, I think the other great thing that, um, that happened unexpectedly when I wrote Archaeology from Space, it, it allowed me to refine my storytelling craft. Because look, as archaeologists, this is what we do. We are storytellers. Whether we're writing books or grants or articles or we're sharing our work uh, over the water cooler with our colleagues or we're asked to present something to the dean at the start of the semester by our chair. Uh, of course, most importantly, when we're in the classroom with our students. The process of writing this book made me a better teacher. It made me a more effective communicator. So I think everyone who's written a book has found the same. So, so do it for those reasons. Um, you'll learn how to better condense your stories. You'll learn how to reframe them. Um, and, and that in turn will, will help you, I think, across all areas of, um, of whatever you're doing. And by the way, I should say, um, you know, writing popular archaeology books, that's not just for archaeologists. That's not just for people who have PhDs or MAs or people who have BAs who are practicing archaeologists. Um, I encourage anyone who has an interest and a passion to write popular archaeology books. This is not limited in any, in any way, shape, or form. I also want to talk to you a little bit about privilege because that's important. I love this, this image. Um, think about who makes a seller lists, think about who has opportunities, and think about who should. Because it's my job now, I think, as someone who's, who's written a popular book, to encourage and mentor and work with other women, uh, people of color, uh, in indigenous um, archeologists, obviously never to tell them what to say, but to, if they need advice, uh, on how to go through this process. I'm very, very happy to do this. I've, I've worked with a number of, of uh, other archeologists, just giving them advice and encouraging them. Um, and just because so many, the pr predominantly, uh, predominantly white men that have written popular archeology span books over the last 40 or 50 years, and this is slowly changing, but we need more voices. So we always have to stop back and, th step back and think, who's writing these stories? How are they writing them? And what stories are being shared or are not being shared because of the perspectives of the author writing it. Um, we also have to think about what makes a bestseller. Again, kind of getting back to this point of it doesn't matter if your book is, is a bestseller or not. So much of it is rigged. So much of it has to do with advertising and, and timing, whatever publicity you get. Don't don't, don't worry because your book wasn't a bestseller because it didn't sell all, all the copies you hoped it would. Like that honestly doesn't, doesn't matter at all. So I want to talk to you now um, about the process of writing the book, how it came to me. Um, I was actually out at a, a, a wonderful restaurant in Birmingham with my husband. We'd had a rare date night and we'd had a, a few adult beverages because we'd Ubered there and um, we could enjoy ourselves a little bit. And the whole book just into my head all at once. I knew exactly what I wanted to write. This may or may not happen to you. It happens to some people, other people, it's a long, slow process. Um, and at that point, I was able to dive into the book proposal, um, working with my agent, crafting it. Uh, we then sent it out to uh, publishing houses. I went to New York, <clears throat> excuse me, met with a number of, of um, houses, just Henry Holt was the right fit. I had a wonderful editor, Michael Signorelli was his name, um, and then started that process. So I started writing the book 
in um, September of 2017. I had a full draft by, um, I wanna say May of 2018. I worked around the clock. I taught a full course load, by the way, when I wrote the book. Um, I didn't sleep much for that period of time. I fully note that I could not have written this book without the extraordinary help and support of my husband. Um, I think at the time our son was either in kindergarten or four, K4. So of course he was in school during the day. We had um, extra support with a, with a babysitter on weekends when I needed to write. So I fully acknowledge, and that, you know, I think a lot, from a lot of male authors, they never acknowledge the support and help that they got at home. And I fully acknowledge the support I had and the sacrifices my husband had to make that year for me to be able to write this book. So you definitely need a support system um, in place. It's, it's very, very hard to write. By anyone with the kids, full empathy. Like writing a book with a four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, or any kid for that matter, it's just hard. So my process was I, I would write the chapters, uh, the outlines in great detail. I would uh, then send the outlines to my editor to make sure that he liked the art, the flow of the book. I'll talk to you about art in a few minutes. Um, I would then write um, what I referred to as the dumpster fire draft. Um, like I said, the most important thing for writing is writing. You need to get words down and it doesn't matter if you write 8,000 words and 7,500 of them are just trash. It doesn't matter, you've written. Editing is much, much easier than writing. You get your ideas out, you can kind of see what you wanna do, you go from there. Each one of my chapters probably went through between 15 and 20, in one case, 25 draft iterations. So like I said, don't worry that your first draft is terrible. It doesn't matter. There are gonna be some gems in there. There are always gems. There are always nuggets uh, of greatness. And there are always paragraphs where you read and you're like, well, maybe I'll tell it this way and then I'll tell it this way. And then you'll end up shifting everything around. Um, I had, uh, I should note, some wonderful people help with editing. I hired um, some outside readers, which of course they were, they were fairly compensated for helping me to think through um, how to frame each chapter. I also had um, so someone who um, had also uh, taken classes and was, was a specialist in geospatial analysis and remote sensing. So she would, I, I'll talk about my references in a couple minutes, but she would double, she would reference check everything and make sure that all my references were exact in terms of page numbers, in terms of making sure that I had framed my arguments exactly around what had been said in that specific part of an article or book. Um, I take, I took and I take fact checking very, very seriously. There are a lot of popular anthropology, social science books um, that are terrible. I'm not gonna name any names, but they've been super sloppy about their, um, about their about the research. And I should note that in the three years since Archaeology from Space has been published, I've only had one person write me about one tiny error that was in the book. I had a, a king and I referred to the king as so-and-so the second, and it should have been so-and-so the third. Um, so that was my one book error. Um, I'm sure there are others, but I was very proud that we only had this one teeny, teeny, tiny error. And he even wrote us, well, I, I can see why he thought it was so-and-so the second. There's some room for it, but it was probably this king the third. Um, so just make sure, do not underestimate the power of a fact checker. Um, and I know not everyone can afford to hire help, um, but it's definitely worth an investing in a little bit of it. Um, a great editor is a partner. Um, and my editor, Michael, um, gave me a lot of tough love. Um, you know, I came into this, I was a full professor. I'll talk a little, a little bit about the privilege of, 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 of being a full professor and having tenure and getting to write these books. Um, and he told me, he said, just to let you know, I, I can tell we're gonna get on, I can tell we're gonna be friends but I'm not going to be nice to you in the process of editing. I mean, of course I'm going to be nice to you, but it will hurt. Like it will physically cause you pain to read my comments about your writing. Um, it's not personal. I mean, yes, it's personal, but it's not personal. Um, and the more you, you, you absorb it and the more you take it in, the better uh, it, it's gonna be a gauntlet for you, especially the first couple chapters. And I kid you not, like, I, I don't know if a single word survived the first round of editing. I think he sort of circled one sentence and said, this has some potential. So I allowed myself to rage and cry and eat a lot of Ben and Jerry's. And then I dove into editing. 
And the next editing round, it was a little bit better. And then it got a little bit better and a little bit better. So the entire process of writing humbled me. Um, and it will humble you too. But through that process, process, through that crucible that you go through, you will emerge a far better storyteller, a far better teacher, and a far better writer. It will make you a far better writer. So that's another thing I want, I want to mention. You know, being a, um, being a professor, our job is to write. And we don't really know how to communicate with the general public. I mean, some people are naturals. One in a thousand, I don't know, can, can do this effortlessly. But for me, it was a process. Um, and, and I'm still learning to this day. Yeah, and the, I love this, the, the gif of Kermit the Frog batting away at the keyboard. The, the number one way to learn how to write is to write. You write, and you write, and you write. Um, and like I said, a great editor is a great partner and, and I couldn't have done this without him. Um, how do you decide what to include? Well, think about your favorite stories to tell. Think about the stories that come up again and again and again when you're sitting down with your family, when you're out with friends, when you're in the classroom, what are the half dozen stories or even the three stories that you find yourself telling? Because those stories put in to the bigger story that you have to tell. And you may think, well, I don't know what book I can write or what is going to end up connecting everything. But as you start to write down your stories, the stories you love to tell, the stories you've always wanted to tell about this one time when you were in the field and it was late afternoon and you were wrapping up for the day and you were going down with your trowel and you were scraping wind. This, this pot shirt popped up and it didn't look like much, but when you brushed away the dust, you saw this part of a, a, a mark of writing and oh my gosh, you saw that in a museum 10 years before. And given that this is a circular context, that shows this is an amazing, you know, this part of this site is connected to a time period that you never thought before. Um, and it's, but you see, I, I, I wasn't even there and I'm getting excited thinking about it. So, so think about those stories. Think about those transformative moments that you had in the field or when you saw something of your colleagues, because that's going to bring out your excitement, your enthusiasm, your passion um, and you, the essence of who you are. And that is the most, I think, important part of writing a popular book. You want to tell whatever story or stories you're telling using your own voice. Um, so, so, so number one, you want to tell your story um, because how did you become an archaeologist or how did you get interested in this thing, this story, this book? You have to convince your audience, your reader, within the first two pages, probably on page one, why they should go on this journey with you. You are seducing your readers on page one, and it is a seduction, I assure you. You're going, hey, I got the goods. You wanna learn more? Come with me, take my hand. And it's a process, right? It's, it's a dance of the seven veils. You're slowly revealing and you're, you're, you're never telling them everything. You're, you're, you're showing them a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and you're making them turn those pages. You're convincing them every page they turn, it's gonna be worthwhile for them to keep turning those pages. And it is so hard to get that Right, because all books have their ebbs and flows. There are some chapters in my book. I, I couldn't make them any sexier. You know, the chapter I wrote on the history of, of remote sensing for archeology, span I had to tell the story, I had to tell the history and it's sort of history. It is it's real dry. I tried to spice it up, but it didn't work. I think I would approach it differently now. That's okay, it's part of this process. But think about your own personal story. So to me, this is what makes writing hard. Um, you, you've got to um, reveal a lot about yourself. You have to be vulnerable when you're telling these stories. And the, the Academy does not reward discomfort and it does not reward vulnerability. So you have to decide before you start writing this book, am I, I, I going to be vulnerable? Am I going to share my innermost thoughts and ideas? I'm nothing too different as secrets, but are you going to share how you came to this field? Are you going to share... Um, what makes you you when you're digging? That's what your audience wants to hear. For me, you know, my own story, of course, I, I was inspired by my grandfather, um, Harold Young. He was a professor at the University of Maine and one of the pioneers in using aerial photography for forestry. That's my story. It's real. It's genuine. So, you know, whatever your story is, you need to tell that as part of your book because your readers want to know who you are. Um, and, and I think for me, the, the best part of 
one of the best outcomes of the book has been the number of my friends uh, and family members who've read it and said, you know, it's, it's you. I hear you in your words. And we self-edit so much in academia. Um, we don't allow ourselves to come out. We write in, very terse, uh, in a very terse way, in a way that's not comfortable. So you have to find your voice. And it's so hard because it means you have to be vulnerable. And this is why my editor put me through the gauntlet. He broke me down and broke me in part to get me to come out. And once I started doing that, the writing got easier. And it's not an easy process to go through. Um, of course, I had to tell my, my Indiana Jones story um, because, you know, I was inspired by Indiana Jones when I was a kid growing up, as were many people in my generation. Um, you know, I'm a huge sci-fi fantasy fan. Um, my favorite chapter to write in, in my book was um, The Future of the Past, the story of, um, I think I'm skipping around a little bit, that's okay, uh, the story of, of science fiction. And I'll tell you about that in a few, in a few moments. Um, the other thing too I would recommend, you know, I read everything growing up. I was an obsessive reader. Um, it's a little bit trite, but the more you read, the better storyteller you'll be. And there have been so many wonderful uh, historical fiction books written. You know, read those books, look at how writers that are celebrated craft stories about specific moments in time or specific historic events. I tell all my colleagues, um, read Eric Larson. He is the best, I think, or one of the best nonfiction writers in the world. Start with Devil in the White City, which is the story of the Chicago World's Fair in 1884, 1885. And when you read the book, you think this has got to be fiction, the way that it's written. It is not fiction at all. Read people like Eric Larson. He will teach you, he and others will teach you how to craft stories even better. Um, the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is... Um, humor. Um, I love to tell jokes for any of you that follow me on social media. You know, I love bad jokes. I'm ridiculous. Um, and my editor told me very early on, you think you're a comedian and that's not why people are reading, you're going to be reading your book. They're going to be reading the book because they want to learn more about remote sensing and you're a specialist in remote sensing. And you can have some jokes in your book because that's who you are. You're a goofball, but this is not a yuck a minute book. And he probably deleted 75% of my jokes. Um, I thought some of them were really good, but to be a good writer, you have to murder your darlings. Um, so it's, it's okay, I understand now. Um, but you're not as funny as you think you are, um, is the general consensus amongst readers. And they've got to land really, really well. So having a few well-placed jokes throughout your book, or maybe one in every chapter is fine. But you're, like I said, you're not as funny as you think. Um, leave the humor, light touches, you'll, you'll be happier for it. So the other thing I want to talk about, and I don't have a lot of time left, um, I want to talk to you about tension, because you're telling the story of the past, and you're often framing it in terms of today, and it's this push me, pull you back and forth. And you have to find that as you're writing your book. That's really, really hard to do, because the tension, this pull, is pushing your readers forward in the book. Um, and think about the way you're telling your stories. Think about what happens next. Think about what's drawing people in. Um, and, and tension, too. You have to think about what matters to you and what matters to your audience. You may be super, super excited about describing a particular kind of pot or pottery type in great, great detail because it's what you do. Your audience may only want to hear about it in a couple sentences. So I recommend field testing everything you try. I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Um, and I'll talk to you more about, about science fiction. You know, uh, N.K. Jemisin, uh, Octavia, Octavia Butler, uh, Ursula Le Guin. Um, there's so many extraordinary sci-fi fantasy authors, Neil Gaiman, uh, uh, Neil Stevenson, I could go on and on and on and on. Um, I, I've, we have a really lovely sci-fi fantasy collection. To me, like, because it's so inspiring, because it challenges us to think about different worlds and different spaces, um, I, I think my love of science fiction has helped me to be a better archeology span communicator. And that's something I would recommend to all of you. Um, read more sci-fi. The idea of imagining other worlds, other places, the people that embody those worlds, it's what we do. 
We're, we, we, we're, we're sort of science fiction writers in our own way, shape and form, but we're telling stories from the past, not the future. Um, so just, just some advice. It certainly helped me a lot. Oh, another great book I recommend uh, by my, my good friend, Monica Byrne, The Actual Star. I think it's one of the best examples of how to recreate stories of the past. She tells a story of um, the ancient Maya the event that happens around a thousand years ago. So just highly recommend it to all of you who want to learn better ways of shaping the stories you tell about specific periods of time. Um, tone also matters a lot. Um, we, you know, one of, one of my biggest problems when I was writing this book, I often came across as way too pedantic because guess what? I'm a professor. That's what I do. Um, so you have to imagine yourself sitting at a bar telling stories to your friends. You have to imagine yourself telling stories at an elder care facility. You have to imagine yourself telling stories to six or seven year olds. What is going to hold their interest? What words do you choose? What ways do you use to, to, to share stories? And that's your root in. You, you, this is not a professorly book more often than not. It can be an academic book, but tone is essential. Um, I think there are some places in the book when, when I reread it, it definitely comes across as a little too pedantic and I would change that now. But again, it's all part of, of, of learning. I wanna to talk to you about um, totally gratuitous um, uh, photos of, of self, the idea of authenticity. You know, we come across as one way, I mean, these are, these are my very serious media photos where I want to seem like I'm serious and I'm respected and I'm, you know, well thought of. Um, this isn't the person who wrote archaeology from space. I mean, clearly it is. Um, this is the person who wrote archaeology from space. Here I am with actually, yeah, our son just turned nine last week. Uh, face blanked out because I don't share his face publicly until he decides he wants to. Uh, but this is who I am. I mean, I'm a mom. Um, I'm goofy. I like to have fun. I love golfing, I like being fit, I like being with my friends, I like telling jokes. I'm very blessed to, be, to love what I do for work. I, I love traveling. Um, the idea that you share this part of yourself with the broader public when you are um, writing this book is really, really important. And like I said, the Academy shuts that off. You're not supposed to share this vulnerable part of yourself, but the more you're able to reveal who you are, um, what makes you you, and the more you're, that translates into the stories you're telling about the past, the better your book, your book will sing if you, if you can crack that nut, and it's really, really hard to do. Um, I want to tell you a little bit, um, and then I'll, I'll start to wrap up, um, about the importance of references. So Archaeology from Space had 800 references in the back. You may have missed them. Go back and check them out. Um, to me, I wanted a, a scholarly book disguised as a popular book, but every single thing I say is backed up with multiple references, or in some cases, one, one reference. Um, and I was really, really careful and intentional in how I used my references and in the examples I used in the book. I admit um, fully and I acknowledge uh, Pulitzer Prize winning science writer, Ed Young. Um, he has talked a lot about his sources and how he strives for equality. And, and, and ethical representation um, in the people he interviews and how he really tries to strike a balance in the diversity of voices he chooses to feature. And I tried to do the same thing in archeology span from space. Um, in all the examples that I gave throughout the book, it's almost 50-50 male, female. Uh, and I discussed, and, and one third of the uh, examples that I used in archeology span from space uh, were indigenous archaeologists and anthropologists. I recognize that that number I will certainly strive to do better in my next book. Um, but representation was really important to me. You know, a book is a platform and the choices that you make um, with what to feature and who to feature and the stories you tell around them are really important. Um, and I, I highly recommend that you be super intentional around who and what you choose to represent and think very, very carefully about it and really strive, I think, for getting good representation because your book is going to be better for it. The number of books that I have read, and it is chapter after chapter, uh, chapter after chapter, examples of work that's been done by mostly white men. Come on, really? That's not our field. Um, diversity of, of, of studies, of research, of voices is going to make your book richer and it's going to make your stories better. So please, please consider this deeply as you are writing your book. 
So think too about the, um, the stories you're telling. And, and, and as I said before, make sure to practice, you know, go into schools, go into elder care facilities, guest lecture for your colleagues, um, invite friends over, field test stories, see what bites, see what excites people. Everyone wanna hear you practice. No one's gonna say no. Hey, I've got some cool stories to tell because I wanna write a book and I wanna see what you liked and what you didn't like. Pull people after. What worked, what didn't work? What excited you? What grabbed you? Um, if you can tell the same stories and engage six-year-olds and 96-year-olds in the same way, you've got it. You've, you've cracked the code, you, you, you know the secret sauce. So practice as much as you can. You know, writing a book, Sarah, I think you're frozen. We appear to have lost Sarah for a moment. Please be patient. We'll try to get this back. Oh, hello, can you hear me now? Yes, you're back, thank you. Sorry, sorry. I don't know what happened. I, I just got booted out. Let me reshare my screen, I'm almost done and then we'll open it up for, for, um, for questions. I apologize to everyone. I have no idea how that happened, but it did, um, but I'm back. So yeah, I wanna wrap up by, um, by saying, get that larger, um, think about the stories you're telling. Um, think about the proposal you're writing. You have to, ultimately, you have to find out what grabs you the most. And what you're passionate about. And I want to end uh, with, with if any of you have seen Tick, Tick, Boom, um, the wonderful movie directed by Lynn manuel Miranda about Jonathan Larson. And in the movie, um, uh, Larson did this play, and it's very well received, and he gets all sorts of kudos, but it, you know, it almost to buy it. And he speaks to his agent and says, I don't understand. Everyone loved it. All these kudos and nothing. And she said, guess what? You get to write the next one. And then the next one. And then the next one. And maybe one of them will land. But the important thing is you get to write the next one. And that's the best advice I will give to all of you about writing. Because book writing, once you're finished, and I hope it goes as well for you as, as you want it to be, but you'll be a better writer. You'll be a better storyteller. You'll be a better archaeologist for it. And then you get to write the next one. And then you get to write the next one. Um, so I want to end on that thought and thank, thanks again to the AIA for letting me present today. Um, and now I want to open, uh, open things up for questions. Well, you have to maybe be hearing the clicking because I think everyone listening has started writing a book. <laughs> 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 We're all excited to now write a book. Um, Michael Callaghan says, thank you for such a wonderful and inspiring talk. My question relates to archaeologists who are working in the university system with tenure and promotion requirements. Books for the general public and released by non-university presses are often valued less or even frowned upon by promotion committees and administrators. This has a chilling effect on archaeologists who want to write for public audiences. Do you have any advice on how to overcome this issue and how were you able to overcome it? Right, so I fully admit, you know, I wrote archaeology from space when I was a full professor, when there were no issues whatsoever around how or why I wrote it. Um, and the other advice I've given to um, especially younger women 
uh, or women, I should say, should frame that, that that's an ageist statement, um, uh, women who are at an earlier stage in their careers, um, wait until you have tenure before you write a popular book or burning to get out a popular book, be very, very quiet about it. Quietly get an editor or agent, quietly write your proposal and do it on the side and wait until you have tenure. And this is terrible, right? But ultimately this is the academy and, and you, you are absolutely right in what you say. They wanna see that you have this scholarly book and whatever articles or books or grants, high teaching evaluations, you use is a perfectly valid point. And I agree with you. I mean, the academy is broken. You know, we, one of the reasons I think that so many fascists have co-opted symbols of the past to use for themselves is because our field hasn't done enough. Our field didn't, enough. Our field didn't value engaging with the public. And even now it's not valued in the same way I think it should be. So I agree, it's, it's a huge issue. I hope someday it changes, but for now, get tenure first or have it ready to go. The second you get that letter from your dean and your university president, and then you're good to go. You know, the irony is we need the young lay public to know the stories, to get interested, to study. So you have students to teach as a professor. <laughs> I know, it's all like a self-fulfilling prophecy and like, you know, I mean, you're, you're lucky if all 200 people read whatever scholarly tome that you write. You're lucky. Yeah. So. Well, and you, and you hopefully you have a lot of cousins or aunts and uncles who will buy That's it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Megan Walsh says, a newish grad student here, how do you manage to keep yourself motivated when you feel you've hit a rut? Sometimes writing flows, but when it doesn't, do you have any tips? Right. So, you know, that happens to me often. Um, and, and you have to find, because it can be so like, you know, depending on what you, what you do in your background, I mean, any, any academic field, there's rampant sexism and bigotry and the grind and, and professors can be downright mean, fellow students can be mean. Um, you may just lose interest. You may lose focus. Also look at the mess of the world. All these things are swirling in a blender. Um, and you, you got to make yourself a smoothie from it every day and drink from it and go, go to your classes. So I think to me, um, when I'm in a rut, when I'm having trouble, when I'm struggling, I try to think back to what got me excited, what inspired me about doing the work. And I'm very, very lucky because right now for me, my main inspiration comes from my students. I get to be in a classroom with them and they get to be excited and inspired. Um, so that, that can get me going again. But if you're a student, if you're a grad student and you're just starting out, um, think about why you want to be an archeologist or an anthropologist. What is that thing you want to do more than anything else? What is your dream? If you could do anything you want, I want to work at Site X, that is my vision. And then treat yourself to learning more about it, right? Maybe it's Chaco Canyon, maybe it's Machu Picchu. Uh, maybe it's the Indus Valley civilization, whatever the thing, or pottery or seeds or bones, whatever, whatever that thing is that gets you so excited, you can't stop talking about it. If you want to learn more about it, find that one thing and start developing a library of resources around it that you can return to again and again to get you re-energized and inspired because ultimately you're working towards that, right? The ability to do that work you want, do the work you want in the area you want. Um, so treat yourself, treat yourself to learning more about what, what you're most excited about. And I hope, I hope that will work. Also, like lots of chocolate, baking, uh, tea, uh, self-care, long walks, um, go into a closet and scream and punch things, like all of that too. <laughs> but also make sure to, to, to read, read what you love. Uh, Annalise Baer says, which aspects or areas of archaeology do you think would benefit most from having more popular books written about them? Oh gosh, so so many. Hi, hi Annalise, how are you doing? Um, I, I know Annalise, she's wonderful. Um, and she has a great TikTok, by the way, that I highly recommend all of you sign up for. She does incredible, incredible work. Um, I think um, people want to know, it seems, more about archeological science. So more, more about radiocarbon dating, more about um, cool chemical analyses that are going on, these big changes we're seeing in our ability to image sites, not just satellite imagery, um, but, but other areas as well. So definitely archeological science. Um, I think people love reading about specific topic areas. You know, what's a great popular book on the Inca? 
there have been a bunch, but but not necessarily books written for 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 mass audiences. So I think big popular books about specific cultures um, would, would be great. Um, so, oh yeah, and the other thing I want to mention, because I didn't talk about it in my talk, but I'll mention it quickly. Um, the idea of including fiction in your books about the past, I had a bunch of fiction, both science fiction and regular fiction, and I loved writing those chapters. So definitely including including more stories like that. Um, th those, those things got really positive feedback from, from readers. I have to tell you, there all of a sudden the questions are flowing in, so we need to save them. So if you want to, uh, get back to some of these people, maybe, but we we need to kind of wrap up. And Kathy Lynch asked a question I'm dying to know, so we're going to finish with it. She says, um, "What is, is your Global Explorer project still active? And if so, is there an update on your progress?" Thank you for asking that question. I meant to share that with you. Yes, so um, we are set, or we're set, just before the pandemic kicked off, to relaunch our platform in India. And I was on a plane on my way uh, from, from Atlanta to London, because I was about to go from London to Delhi to do a huge national media event with the Tata Trusts uh, and the Archaeological Survey of India and the Ministry of Culture, all of whom are funders and partners as part of the platform relaunch. And we were going to announce it and development was going to start and we were going to launch it at the end of 2020. And then the pandemic hit, but the real problem was that I was stranded in London because all visas were canceled to India the moment I landed. Um, so we had a little bit of a delay because of the, the pandemic. Um, a lot of uh, India, uh, a lot of a lot of things in India shifted more to healthcare, as you can imagine. But we're very lucky; we have an incredible team um, in India. We have a wonderful um, set of partners in the Ministry of Culture and the Archaeological Survey of India, and of course the Tata Trusts. And we finally, finally have started platform redevelopment. So slight delay, but I think everything's been delayed by two years. Um, so we'll hopefully have a beta uh, platform at the end of this year, beginning of next year. And we're hoping to launch the new version of our platform in spring 2023. So you'll be hearing a lot about it. Of course, the whole world will be invited. It will be a Lamborghini compared to the, uh, the old Chevy track of the previous platform. Um, all sorts of new bells and whistles. We're gonna be incorporating some machine learning into it, which I think will be super awesome. So hopefully it will be a better user experience for everyone involved. And of course, we'll be working very closely with the Ministry of Culture and the Archaeological Survey of India. They'll be going on and doing surveys as new sites are discovered. So we're really, really excited about, um, about what, what's gonna be done next year. The, the sad thing about that is you had almost a year or two years of us trapped, desperate to do something, and you, it would have been a wonderful time sink. <laughs> I, I know, I know, I know. If it had just been a little earlier. Uh, life happens, right? Life, life happens. <laughs> life happens. Life happens. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, and it really is exciting and motivating to think about we will, for all of you, we didn't get to your questions. I'm so sorry, they're really good questions and I would have loved to have heard her answers, um, but we will share them with her and thank you for joining us. Um, if you want to hear more exciting lectures from AIA, please consider being a member. Uh, go to our YouTube channel, there are past lectures there. We have a lot of lectures coming up this fall, so, all kinds of opportunity to interact with both the AIA and the world of archeology. span Sarah, thank you not only for today, but for writing a magnificent book that oh, thank you. thoroughly was fun to read and I loved the jokes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much for listening today. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.